this morning? Anyways, um, I'm excited to get back into our series. And uh, I want you to get back into jo- uh, Job. So turn there real quick as you're, as you're turning there. Um, last week we kind of we kind of explained when life doesn't go as planned, it just seems like God is like this this thread is weaved from the beginning to the end of the book of the Bible that God is at his best. God is is going to be at work when life doesn't go as planned, and uh, you'll find a lot of times that um, you have you and I have agendas and the way that we want to see things go in life, and 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 uh, sometimes it doesn't go that way, right? And we get a little bit cranky, a little bit frustrated about that. But it seems when you when you look at the stories of the Bible, you find that God is about to do something great, and and so God is about to do something great in Job's life. And uh, now the book of Job, we don't know who wrote the book of Job. All all we know is um, it's. It's agreed that it's one of the oldest pieces of literature that we have for the Bible that's been agreed to be a part of the, story, of, the of the canon uh, of the book uh, that we consider uh, scripture, inspired scripture, that um, it's a piece of wisdom literature. The idea is it helps us to get to know God a little bit better and, and, and ourselves uh, a little bit better as well. And uh, so a little bit about Job is that he's from the line of Shem and Noah had three boys and so uh, you all know and remember the flood and when that all happened, God brought Noah and his wife and his three boys and their families into the ark along with those animals. And uh, Shem was one of them. And when the water receded, uh, Shem, his, his lineage, his, his uh, family of origin, uh, lived and dwelled on the east side of the Jordan. And that's where Job is from, is from the land of Uz, which is on the east side of Jordan, or east side of the uh, Euphrates. It's like it, through modern day Iraq, it's from the northwest corner to the southeast corner and so it's split in half and they they settled on the east side of it and uh, a little bit about um, uh, him is that uh, we don't know when he actually lived the interesting thing about it if you look at Job chapter 1 look at the end of verse 3 it says he was the greatest man among all the peoples of who what's it say of all the peoples of the east he's the greatest I mean the the most renowned even though this is the only part really uh, Jeremiah um uh, mentions him uh, about the land of Uz, but the, the idea is there's not a whole lot about there in the Bible that's uh, talking about Job. And, uh, and so here's this greatest man, but he's, he's, he's after Shem, but he's before Abram. We don't know where he's at in that, um, but this is where he, uh, he lived. And we know a, a little bit about him that he had a family of seven or ten kids, seven boys and three daughters. He, it says in verse 3 that he owned how many, how many thousand sheep? What does it say? Three, you know, 7,000 sheep. He owned 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, uh, he, uh, 500 donkeys, had a large number of servants. He's, got, he's like wealthy. He's got all this stuff. He's like the Amazon of the, the old days, you know, and, and uh, because that's what they would use those animals, pack animals to, to, to deliver and to transport and stuff like that. And so he's, this guy, he's done really well. I mean, like life is gone really well. Now, a little bit about Job is that Job has a limited perspective about God. You know, all Job knows is what he knows. And uh, it's like it's like looking through a piece of glass on a door. It's like, all I know is I'm on this side of the door and I see that little piece of glass back there and I can just see a little bit. I, I, I can, I, I'd only know so much. My field of vision is only so far. It, it would change if I were on the other side of the door, but I'm on this side of the door. And that's exactly what's going on with Job. His view of God is that God is this powerful God, that he's the creator of the heavens and the earth, uh, but that also God is a God of justice and judgment, that he is going to judge wickedness. Because they, all they know is there was a story of the flood. And, and so what they know is that there was great wickedness on the land and that God was going to judge that. And that he sent a flood. And everyone was, everyone was destroyed except for those that were in the ark. And so for him, he's looking at this going, man, that's amazing. That's pretty. He's powerful. One to be feared. That's why it says in Job chapter 1, uh, look at uh, look at verse one. It says he was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. Literally, he respected God and was afraid of Him. It's like you are you are God. You are powerful. And uh, man, I don't want to get on your bad side. I want to be I want to be on your good side because that's why he would often his kids would have feasts in their homes. And it said when when they would be when they were done feasting, he would actually give a burnt offering for each of his kids. And this is why. Look at verse four. Uh, look at verse five, chapter one. It says perhaps my children have what? What's it say? Come on now. 
they've sinned. Perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. So he's afraid that there's a moment that's like, listen, no, God is good, God's powerful, and we, and we want to honor him, we want to respect him, we want to fear him because he's God, he can do all this stuff. And, uh, and so he would regularly have these sacrifices just to make sure that, like him and, uh, that, that God and him and his family, that we're all okay. And see, that's all he knew about God. And what Job is going to find out that in the midst of difficulty, when life doesn't go as planned, it's an opportunity for God to bring a revelation, a further revelation about who he is. You see, the thing is this, you'll never see it until you experience it, right? Okay, so like Nathan, he had said earlier, he talked about rock climbing, remember that? So how many of you said you've done it before? Real quick. Okay, just a few of you. The rest of you, you're like, you've watched it before, or maybe you've seen it. See, there's something different when you're scaling that wall, and you, you may slip, and you may find out that that person, whether they're paying attention or not with, with you when they're holding the rope at the bottom, you find out real quick if they're paying attention, right? It's like, I find out real quick that I can trust you, or I need to get somebody else on the rope, okay? You know, that, that, you find out real quick. You know, when you're laying on the ground going, I should have had somebody else, you know? It's like, you know, my dad, he, was, uh, he loves NASCAR, and, um, and it's one thing to watch NASCAR from, the, from your, your sofa or your seat, and it's one thing to sit in a passenger, the, the, be the passenger in a NASCAR. My dad, we took him down to uh, Fort Lauderdale, and um, uh, is that where, yeah, the, where the, um, Daytona, or no, Daytona, uh, uh, Daytona Speedway, and we said, for $135, we're going to get my dad. We're going to get him in the, the car. And you should have seen my dad. He's like watched NASCAR all his life. But he said, man, that, all, the, all the hours, all the hours that I've watched NASCAR pale in comparison sitting in that seat when he pushed that, that, that accelerator down to the, to the metal. And, man, when I sunk into that seat, there was no feeling like I'd ever felt before. And I'm like going, that's amazing. See, the one thing is, a lot of us are watching life, and we're seeing it from the seat. And God is saying, listen, you'll never know. When we sing that song, you are good, you are good. You will never know how good God is until God's goodness is challenged. You will never know. You will only see it from this side of the door. You'll look through and you say, I think he is. I'm not really sure. I've heard he is. I mean, people talk about it, but I'll never know. You will never know until life doesn't go as planned. You will never know how good God is. See, but we like it when everything's good. And we don't want it to go not as planned. But when it doesn't go as planned, God is at his best. And when God is at his best, he's about to reveal something to you, like he's about to reveal to Job a little bit more about himself. You see, you and I know God as a God of, he's powerful. We know that he's wise. We know, the, we know that he's a defender. We know that he's a savior. We know that he's a forgiver. We know that he's good. We know that he's righteous. We know that he's compassionate. We know that he's just. We know that he's ferocious. We know that he's forgiving. We know this about God through progressive revelation because we got this book. Hello, listen, if you're not reading this book, then you have a limited view. See, you're like looking at God through a little bit, little bitty tiny hole, and when you read God's book, when you read this book, you see that hole starting to expand, and you see more and more, and when God allows you to experience life at its best, listen, he's trying to show you more and more who he is. But you can't get it when you're just watching it. You can only get it when life doesn't go as planned. There's something about that. When life doesn't go as planned, God is at his best. And when God is at his best, he's about to reveal a little bit more about himself to you. So we're going to just open with a word of prayer and ask God just to teach us as he is teaching Job what that looks like. So would you pray with me? I'd like to put our hands in front of us just to say, God, speak to me. So let's pray. God, thank you for this morning. All that to say, all that to say, God, we pray that you would show us a little bit more of you. God, we want to know more about you, how good and how gracious and how trustworthy you really are. But God, it seems like that, it, that we find out how really true you are when life doesn't go as planned. And God, Job discovered that, Job saw that in his limited view of who he knew you to be, he found out that you were so much more. And God, I wonder if there's some folks in this room that maybe they see you with such a limited scope, with a, such a limited view because they, they haven't seen you for who you really are, that you are so much more.
And that God, we, we shy away, we run from, we don't want things to be difficult. We don't want to go through the trials. We don't want to go through testing. But it seems to be, God, that it's in those moments that you reveal more and more of yourself. That you show how good and how powerful and how forgiving and how trusting and compassionate you really are. And so, God, we pray this morning that you would speak to us. God, this is such a delicate subject. And we, we feel for Job because a lot of us have been there before. So God, we pray that you'd speak to us. Holy Spirit, open our eyes to see you and reveal yourself to us so that we can know more and more about who you are. We love you and we give you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said? Amen. Amen. Are you ready? Okay, three of you. The rest of you, I hope you'll get with me. So listen, so the first, the first chapter talks about here's Job's life, and, and on the side of it, on the spiritual side, here's the physical reality of Job's story of chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. But Job chapter 6, or Job chapter 1, verses uh, 6, uh, all the way down uh, through verse 12, there's this moment where all the angels have to present themselves to the Lord. And uh, so you see this uh, story, there's a story behind a story, and that's where we're back to the story. So we're, we, were, we were in the physical reality, we went to the spiritual reality, now we're back to the physical reality, chapter 2, back to the spiritual reality. Look at verse 2, or chapter 2, verse 1. It says, on another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. Now just pause right there. We don't know a whole lot about that, but we do know timetable, that, that, that when God created the heavens and the earth, in there he created the angels. And there's like, if you remember when we celebrated the birth of Jesus, and remember when, when the shepherds were out and they're like tending their flocks at night, and remember there's a big light and, and, and an angel shows up and talks to them, and then it said there was a heavenly host of angels. There's like tons of angels. So we don't know how many, but a ton, all right? So tell the person next to you, I don't know how many, but there's like a ton of angels, all right? And uh, we, know, we know two of them by name. Did you know we know two of them by name? What's the names? We got Michael and Gabriel, so we know two by names, and those are really great names, right? Gabriel, that's a, a great name. Anyways, so here are the angels. So th here's all these angels. They're created, and their job is to worship the Lord and to do his bidding, and it says that every one of them has to present themselves before the Lord, and there's a particular angel, and uh, his name is Satan, or they call him Satan, which means op like uh, accuser or opposer. And the reason why he's an accuser or opposer is because at one point in time, this angel known as Lucifer had decided, I'm going to, instead of worshiping God, I want to be God, everybody worship me. And so he decided to rebel, and it, he was kicked out of heaven, and he had manipulated other angels to follow him, and they too were kicked out of heaven. And what we see is they were kicked out and, and, and uh, sent to the earth, and uh, that's, where they were, that's where they dwelt. But they were to present themselves before the Lord. And here's this one, Satan, he came and to with them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And now his answer is really interesting, and I didn't talk about last week because of time, but I want to talk a little bit about this morning. Satan says, he's answered, he answered the Lord from roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. Now a little bit about this fallen angel that we know as Satan. He's also, another word used to describe him is the word devil. And so here's, here's what Peter, the follower of Jesus, Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 5. Keep your finger here. Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 5. Peter says a little bit more about this, this devil, uh, Satan himself. He says in verse 8 of chapter 5, he says, Be self-controlled and alert. Why? He says, Because your enemy, who? Yeah, your enemy, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion. And what's he doing? He's looking for someone to what? He's looking for someone to devour. You know, I've been to zoos, and I've seen lions. They're ferocious, you know? Like, I don't want to get up there and say, hey, here, kitty, kitty, let me give you a, you know, a little rub down the back, you know? Because you might lose an arm. So the reality is, he's not your friend. He's not, he's not cute and cuddly. He is on the prowl. And Peter says, listen, of anything, you need to understand about this devil, Satan, the accuser, that he is on the prowl. He's like a lion, and he's looking to devour people. So when he says, to, when he says in Job chapter 1 and 2, where he says twice, he says, I've been roaming through the earth. Understand, he's not just kind of going, going, oh, look at that flower. Isn't that pretty? You know? No, he is on the move looking for someone to devour. Jesus says, let me tell you a little bit more about this devil, 
the Satan. That he is a father of what? That he's a father of lies. That he will not tell you the truth. That he is a manipulator. That he twists things up. We see that in Genesis. Where he twists words up so that Eve would be manipulated and, and, and deceived into um, uh, choosing to uh, take the fruit. Uh, he's also known as a thief. Jesus says that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And not only is he a thief and a father of lies, he's not only a, a lion that's here to destroy and just to, to uh, devour people, uh, James says that he's a tempter. That he wants to lure you away from what's right and good and take you into a direction that would destroy or damage your very life. Listen, he's not some cute, cuddly lion. He's here to destroy. And when he goes, he says, I've been roaming through the earth. He is on mission to destroy anybody and everybody on the face of the planet. So this is what he's doing. So he says, back to Job chapter 2. He says, Job chapter, he says, from roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. The Lord said to him, now this is interesting because he said this in the first chapter. He says, have you considered my servant Job? Remember that? You with me? You remember that? Uh, look at verse 9 of chapter 1, uh, or uh, chapter 8, uh, chapter 1, verse 8, sorry. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He describes it, he is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. He says the very same thing here, but look at this. So he, this is huge, you got to check this out. He says, have you considered my servant Job? Well, duh, I, yes, <laughs> because in chapter 1, he had considered him. He said, look at him. There's no one like him. And he said, the reason why there's no one like him is because your hand of favor is on him. You've blessed him. And if you take everything away, he will turn and curse you and say, you, you never were. You weren't and never will be. God. And he says, fine. And he says, you can go, but you cannot harm him. So he goes, and what does he do? All of a sudden, uh, Job has a terrible day. <laughs> you know? It was a terrible day. All these guys come and say, listen, you know, the, the, your sheep are gone, the camels are gone, the, 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 the oxen are gone, and every, you know, everything's gone, and, 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 and even, and, and I'm so sorry to tell you this, but even your kids, all 10 of them, they were in the house in a freak accident, something happened, a store, it just, and it destroyed the house, and everyone in it died. I mean, Job had the worst day of his life. And some of you thought you've had a bad day. That's a bad day. Now, it doesn't minimize your bad day because the point of it is this. In the midst of his bad day, everything else applies. So whatever you're facing, whenever you're facing these things, when life doesn't go as planned, God is at, he's at work. And God wants to be at work in your life. And he goes on to say, listen, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. Verse 3, he is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Now look at this. This should rock you to the core. Listen, if you read the Bible, and I'm asking you to read Job, can you do that? Can you read Job outside of here? Go home and read, no, not now, but go home and read Job. Just keep reading it. Just let it get into your, into your mind and into your, he says, and he still maintains. Why is he still? Because after all of this loss, Job says in verse 20, he says, listen, it goes, after this, Job got up, tore his robe, shaved his head. This is a bad day, and it's okay to be upset about a bad day. Okay, listen, it's all right. It's okay to have a bad day. It's okay to be upset about a bad day. And he said, but in, in, in view of this all, he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. And God says to Satan in verse 3, he says, and he still maintains his integrity. This is huge. The, the, the idea is this, is that he still believes in me. He still believes that I, you know, who I am, that I am God. He has not given up. The, the word, the, the Hebrew word, it's beautiful. It means he is, have you noticed that Job is stubborn like a mule? <laughs> you know, that's what he means. He is stubborn. He's not given up on me. Even though he's lost everything, even though everything has taken away, he still has not given up. He's still not given up on me. 
That's what that word means. And another word, a way to look at it is, he had a grip on me, and you thought that in taking it away, it would loosen his grip and walk away saying, forget you, God, I want to have nothing to do with you. How many people have gone through really tough times and have said, God, I give up? He says, he held on to me, and you thought if he went through this that he would let go and say, forget it, I'm out. I tap, I, I'm out, I give up, I'm no more. It, the word goes on to say, it's not that he let go, but his grip got even what? Anybody know? It got even tighter. You see, you'll never know it, that you, your grip will never get tighter if you're just watching somebody climb the wall. You'll ne- your grip will never get tighter if you're just going to watch it from the seat. No, you got to get in the car. you got to climb the wall. you got to meet him there. When, you, when life doesn't go as planned, that's where you're going to see God at work. You're going to see God at his best. And God is about to reveal more and more to you about himself that you can trust him. See, what he's saying is he held on, and not only held on, he held on even tighter. And he, go, look at it with me. I love this. He goes on to say, and he still maintains his integrity. Though you, Satan, incited me against him without cause. Even though you incited me against him. The word, the idea of inciting me against him is there was no reason for him to go through what he went through. See, because in that culture, understand, they're like thinking, well, if you do the right thing, you'll be blessed. And if you do the wrong thing, you'll be judged. So he's going through this whole debate like, what's, what happened? Did I do something wrong? I thought we were okay. Why is this happening to me? And God says, listen, Job, you don't get it, but over here on this side of the story, it's like, listen, he didn't do anything to deserve what he, what he went through. He didn't. He really didn't. He says, not only that, he says, you incited me against him to ruin him. The word is to swallow him up entirely. You ever felt swallowed up? Maybe not. I went through some really rust. This swallowed him up completely. Like, like he's gone. He's not just floating on the top. He doesn't have some life preserver that he's just kind of floating there. No, no, no. He went in and he went down. And there's like, I'm reaching up and I'm looking for somebody. Help me, but no one's there to help. What's going on here? That was that was what he went through. And he says, You. You incited me against him to ruin him without any, what, reason. You see, some people think that what they're going through is like, it, you read this and you go, is, what game are they playing? What, what game are they playing? See, this should disturb you, should challenge you, should make you go, what in the world is going on? Because from our perspective, we're looking at it on this side going, I don't understand, but there's, a, there's stuff that's going on over here. And God is saying, listen, you want me to allow him to go through that. You think that if it goes through that, it will destroy him. That he'll curse me and forget me and walk away from me. But I'm going to tell you something, that when I allow him to go through those things, it's, that's not what it's going to do. See, what you do is you find out that it strengthens you. That it does something in you. You experience God in the moment. You know. You can say that he's good, but now that you, you know, the epigonosco, the Greek word is not just to know with your head, but to know with experience. Like, I've walked it. I've seen it. He's not just good. So when I sing that song, I'm not just singing that song, which we can do, right? We can sing words that just are words. But when you've been down, when you've been struggling, when you've been hurting, and you say, God, you are good, those words take on a whole new meaning because you saw God in his goodness when life didn't go as planned. Hello. See, that's when you know he's good. Not just sitting on the chair. Not when everything's okay. It's when life doesn't go as planned, God shows up and he's at his best work because he's revealing a little bit more about himself to you so that you can see who he really is. That your little scope, your little view gets a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and you find out truly how good God is. It is not a game to God. These things that you're going through, these things that Job is going through, is not a game. It is to strengthen him. It is to reveal something to him so that he can grow closer and walk closer with the one that he worships. 
So then Satan says this, verse 4, skin for skin, Satan replied, a man will give all he has for his own life. But if you stretch out your hand and you strike his flesh, not just his flesh, but what else? His bones. You strike his flesh and his bones. From the outside to the inside, I'll tell you something, he will surely curse you to your face. I mean, the whole point of saying what he's saying is, listen, if you would just attack, if you would let me take, you know, affect him personally, everything was outside of him, but now it's going to be inside of him. If I, can, if I can have that, that's when he'll turn his attention away from you. I, I know it. Verse 6, the Lord said very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. I want you to understand God is all, always has the final say, and he draws the lines. You need to understand that should comfort you. That no matter what you face, no matter what you go through, God always has the final say for how far uh, it will go, for what it will be. He always will draw the line because he knows. He's got your best intentions at heart. Because he knows that in the midst of that, you're going to see him. And he's drawn the lines because he knows in that he wants you to see him. And that's exactly what's going to happen here. So look at it with me. So verse 7 says, So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord, and what, what did he do? And afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Uh, the word um, afflicted here, the word sores actually, is the word fever and inflammation. So there's these sores that are on the inside and outside. He's got a fever that he cannot break. And everything's inflamed. And you look at it, you go, man, that, that, that stinks, but there's even more. And he doesn't get into it except for you see a little bit more in Job chapter 30. Can you put your finger there in Job 2? Look at Job chapter 30. Real quick, Job chapter 30. In one of his conversations with the guys that came to visit him, and we're not going to talk about them today, but in Job chapter 30, he tells a little bit more about what he's experiencing. Look at verse seven, 17 of chapter 30. He says, night pierces my bones. My gnawing pains never what? You ever deal with chronic pain? Like every second, every day, every moment, there's, there's no Vicodin, there's no, well, just take four ibuprofens. You'll be okay, right? There's, there's I, I have talked to people that have had chronic pain. And it is one of the most despairing things that they deal with. It's like there's that, that it never seems to go away. In fact, I was talking to someone, they were telling me, they said that moment in between when you're dealing with chronic pain, that moment that you're sleeping and you wake up, it's in that in between, it's, it's, it's the best time of your day. And it's so brief. He's saying it never went away. This kind of suffering. Not only that, he goes on to say, look at verse uh, 27. He says, the churning inside of me, this is like nausea, the sickness that's inside of me, it never stops. Days of suffering confront me. I mean, nauseous all the time. This disturbance, uh, you, you feel unsettled, ill, you're hurting, you, you've got this fever, you feel weak. It's like pain and inflammation, and it's like, I can't move. Every inch I move, it like hurts. And, and not only that, it gets even worse. Look at verse 30. He says, my skin does what? It grows black, and it peels. So not only is that, it's like my flesh is dying on my bones. Can you imagine? This is what he's going through. And he's like, man, this is what he's, there's this, this is horrible. So back to, back to Job 2. So this is what he's going through, and it's just a horrendous moment. Can you imagine Job? Again, he's still wondering, what in the world happened? What's going on here? Why is this happening to me? I thought we were okay. I could work with this. There's got to be a reason. There's got to there's be a good reason for this, right? It says in verse 8, Then Job took a piece of broken pottery, and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. Sitting among the ashes is a si another sign of mourning. So he is hurting. He's really struggling with this. And understandably so. It's hard to go through that. I couldn't imagine. But he is hurting, not just physically, but emotionally. God, where are you? 
And they say there's a couple of options of looking at this. In Deuteronomy, they talk about what, why you would break pottery and scrape himself. Some people say, hey, listen, this is like a, you're like worshiping the dead or, or doing something for the dead. And a lot of scholars don't believe that's what he's doing. What, what they think he's doing here, it's kind of like a counter uh, irritation. Like when you're like in pain, you try, it's like I need to distract my mind so that I can get my mind off my pain. And that's probably hard. You've probably had to deal with that before. I'm, I'm hurting, and I'm trying to get through this, but how do I distract myself? When your kid is sick, and you're like, listen, I'm trying to get you through, but how do I distract them so that they can forget about the pain that they're going through so that they can have a brief relief? And that's what he's saying here. He's scraping himself, going, listen, how do I distract myself? How do I have a moment of relief from the pain? Now, all of this is going on with Job. So he loses everything. Now his, now his body is breaking down. He is laying in bed. He probably can't go anywhere and do anything. It's like, what has happened? And when you're in that moment, you have a lot of time to think. And you're like going, God, where are you? What's happened? Why is this happening to me? But there's one more person that's around him, and that's his wife. Look at verse 9. He said, wife said to him, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. I mean, how's that for an encouraging word? I mean, can you imagine? I mean, here's your wife. She's watching you go through all this. Now, before we start to get a little bit cranky with Job's wife, like, what are you talking about? Listen, I've done a lot of research about people that um, are caregivers. And when you watch somebody suffer, that is one of the hardest things to, to, to endure. It's like, I would do anything to help you be, feel better. I would, if there's something I can say or somewhere I can go or something I can do, I just want you to feel good. And I think Job's wife was getting to this moment where she's saying, I don't know how much more I can bear. And there's a moment where a lot of caregivers say, there's this, there's this, prayer that they hesitate to pray but they say Lord maybe it's better if you took them home so that their suffering can end and they never want to say that but it's that that place that I think she found herself in again she's got a limited view of God so she doesn't understand why is this happening because she's got her own questions and Job answers, look at how he responds to her. He says, you are talking like a foolish woman. <laughs> it's like, whoa. But the word foolish, the idea is ignorant. The idea is you don't know what you're saying. You don't know who he is. You don't understand. You're, you're speaking about someone with a limited perspective. And how often have we spoken about God from a limited perspective? And sometimes we take that limited perspective and then we try to help each other out and say, well, I know why this is happening to you. We're going to get into that. And it's in our limited perspective that we look at and try to explain why this is happening to people. And Job's like, we don't, we, we don't know all about who God is. He's revealing himself to us. And we, on the other side of the door, get to say, I know, Job, if you could just know God is good, that God is gracious, that God is compassionate. We've been there. We've seen it. We just, if we could just infuse this, this faith, this strength to you, we would. Because he really is. But Job's got to go through this to know this to be true. And Job said, hey, listen, shall we accept good from God and not trouble? The idea here, the word accept, means to receive patiently, with meekness. In other words, what he's saying is, God has been good to us. He has been pleasant. He is lovely. He's been delightful. He's been fruitful. I mean, look at all the things that God has done. But we patiently also receive the trouble that comes our way. Because I think, even though I may not understand everything that's going on here, God is revealing a little bit more about himself that there's a perfectly good reason why he's allowing us to go through this. There's got to be a perfectly good reason. And I think James, on the other side of the door, is telling us what that reason is. So go there, real quick, okay? Joe, James chapter 1. You've read this before. Come on, this isn't new. 
James chapter 1, remember verse 2? Remember this? He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face what? Trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops something. What does it develop, class? Come on. Perseverance. Another word for it, stubbornness. Like, I'm going to hold on, and I don't care what I go through. I don't care what I face. I'm going to hold on, and I'm going to hold on, and I'm not going to give up. In fact, I'm going to hold on even stronger. I'm going to hold on even more because I know that you are true. I know that you are good. I know that you are wise. I know that you're compassionate. I'm finding this out to be true, but I couldn't see it with just sitting on the chair. I could only find it when life didn't go as planned. Okay. He says, perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. See, Job has no idea. He's just, God is going to reveal himself a little bit more to him and say, you can hold on to me with everything you've got. And you will find that you can trust me. You can find it and you'll find me faithful and true. And in all this, it says, Job did not sin. In what he said. Amazing. Amazing. So this morning, I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you're going through. But God seems to be at his best when life doesn't go as planned. Because in it, it seems that God wants to reveal a little bit more about himself to you. So would you stand? And we'll we'll close with a word of prayer. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for Job's life. Thank you for the story that he's going through. Lord, oh, it, 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 it must have been so hard to go through what he'd gone through. But I think if Job could stand here today, he would tell us, hey, listen, God is at his best when life doesn't go as planned. Because in that moment, God wants to reveal and share something with you so that you can know, not run away, not turn away, not reject God, but actually lean in and hold on even more and find him to be good, to find him faithful and compassionate even in the midst when life doesn't go as planned. And God, maybe there's someone in this room that has been toying with this idea of giving up and letting go. Lord, I pray that they would not succumb to the temptation of the enemy, but to hold on to you even tighter. God, we love you, and we need you, and and as we need you, we will find you rock solid, a rock that will not move. We give you all the glory and all the honor and the praise, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless. Have a great day. Well, hey, thanks for joining us and watching this video of our sermon this past Sunday. We hope it's been an encouragement to you. Uh, We believe in the ministry of what's happening at Brighton Chapel, and we believe it's going to make a difference in your life. And so we hope that you'll come back and be a part of it. We hope you'll visit us in person, be a part of what's happening here at Brighton Chapel. We hope you have a great day.